continues after uh, today. We only have three more weeks, and so I always like reminding people of that so they don't lose hope. They don't think this is going to go on forever. And two, I like that look of panic on Dave's face. So, uh, no, I'm looking forward very much to that. So, we have officially now, it has taken us more weeks to get through the Passion Week than it was days in the Passion Week. Uh, and that we, and we pointed that out, that that's what John did, that he has, if you remember, we're, today we're going to be in John chapter 18. And if you remember, in John chapter 11, he heals Lazarus. He comes back in John chapter 12, and he is anointed. And then he makes his triumphal entry in John chapter 12. And then you have John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and he's still not been arrested. We still not have gone to court since he made his triumphal entry because John gives us a lot of detail. Uh, and uh, so we're going to, and there's a lot of, there's some things that we, that we pick up in John that you don't pick up. I was talking with Roger before class that you don't pick up in the synoptic gospels or some, some things that are, are included there that aren't included other places. But before we get started and we're, we're okay. Um, what, what is the most romantic movie you've ever seen? Now I, I did. Now, come on guys. I did. I did John Wayne. I did John Wayne about, a month ago or something, I did John Wayne movies, and I mean, they were, whew, they got, they were going all, they were popping all over the place, so that we should have equal time. Okay, Wanda, the bridges of Madison County, okay, that, that's, that certainly qualifies, romantic movie, got it, what else? What? She, the notebook, notebook, all the notebook. The notebook is in many top ten lists as, as the uh, one of the all time most romantic movies. The notebook, and then people are already getting out tissues. All right, so that, <laughs> so, so oh, you did not like it. I, I, oh, oh, okay. We got a difference of opinion uh, here, and that's what makes it. That's what makes it wonderful and great being in the body of Christ. Who else? What's the what's the most romantic? Sleepless in Seattle. Sleepless in Seattle is in many of the lists for top 20. Maybe it's in the top 10. You've got mail, Susan. I travel frequently, and Susan watches You Got Mail pretty much at least once a month, I'm, I'm sure. that uh, And uh, it's, in it, in a, it's like it's new every time. No, it's so You've Got Mail. Um, that, so Jill get the right answer. So that is the that is the correct answer. Casablanca. Uh, in this is the month of love with uh, Valentine's Day, and Forbes magazine uh, released the the top thirty most romantic movies of all time, and also the Inter international movie database also released their list of the top romantic movies of all time. And Casablanca is in the number one spot at, <laughs> look at you, why, Chris is why. Um, the, uh, also in the top 10, I thought that somebody might say was the, the Princess Bride. If, if the mixes were here, I think they watched that about once a month. So I think they would have said the Princess Bride. But Casablanca, um, and anybody, I have some friends who have not seen Casablanca. I went, you know, before... And, you know, there'll be some people in here, Amari, that will say, what, how old are you? But I went to college and there was no Netflix. There was no, you couldn't just go get a movie. You couldn't even go rent a movie. Uh, but they did have on campus, you could go and for a buck, they would have, use one of the big lecture halls and they would show a movie and, I frequently had nothing to do and uh, except study, and that was not a good option because um, any movie, even a black and white one, was going to beat out going to study. So I went to watch Casablanca for a buck, and uh, 
1978, I think. And, and it is it is a great movie. And if you've seen Casablanca um, and you say about a love story, what what makes it? What makes it such a powerful love story? Is any, I don't want to, listen, if you haven't seen it, it's been around for about 82 years. So it's not on me if, if you're getting a spoiler, spoiler alert, okay? It's been around for eight decades, over eight decades. So if this is like, oh, you ruined it, sorry. But what, uh, what makes it such a great movie? At the end, what makes it so romantic? It, it is set during World War II before the Americans' involvement in World War II or just as the Americans are starting to become involved. But what makes it so romantic is at the end, you think it's going to go one way, that that he's going to be, Rick is going to be un, united with his love, Ilsa, after they've been separated so in such a, a tragic way and they were really meant to be together and he secures passage for two people to leave and he meets them at the airport and it's it's not he's not going he doesn't have a bag because he's going to sacrifice his true love in order to so that for the good of what was going to be the, the maybe the war effort and for the good of of what his love and and now her husband and the at the the mission that he had to do. And so he doesn't get on the plane. And John is coming into, we're coming into John chapter 18. And it's, we're bringing, this is, if we were at the movie, then this is at the part where you think they're getting ready to go to the airport. If this was Casablanca, this is near the end. We're in the uh, the time where the black and white gets a little fuzzy and they use that filtering thing and you think, oh, it, this is, uh, we're coming to the conclusion. And John is telling us what really is the most, the greatest love story ever. And he's bringing it into its conclusion here when we get to John chapter 18. He's just gone through the upper room discourse, which is three chapters that uh, which we have, you know, there's discussion about whether or not that takes place in the upper room or whether it takes place on the way. But we know, we know that he gets to John chapter 18, verse one, and it says, after he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and he crossed the Kidron Valley. So, so now, so we know that he had not gotten to this one. This is Dave's map. This is my map. This is what we have to look forward to in a few weeks. This is what we get to avoid after just a couple more weeks. So they were in Jerusalem. There's the Kidron Valley right here, and it's about two miles to Bethany. And he was going across this valley, and he's going to go to the Mount of Olives and to the Garden of Gethsemane. And so this is where he's going to go, but he's not here yet. And so this is where we start John chapter 18. Now, just like in... John chapter 13, when they're in the upper room, John includes something that nobody else, none of the other gospel writers include. He includes, remember, what does anybody remember what it is? It's washing feet. John is the only one who ta talks about Jesus washing feet, which is one of the most powerful examples of Jesus being a servant. Um, is He's come here and he washes their feet. And what does John not include? in John 13, in the upper room. He's the only gospel writer that doesn't include what? The Lord's Supper. He does not include the Lord's Supper in the upper room, but he includes the washing of the feet, which is, and nobody else does. And we're going to see that same thing when we get to John chapter 18. There's a lot of differences in John's account of how this goes, how it's going to go on and what's going to happen. So they get here, they get to the Kidron Valley. If we were looking in the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, then what happens when they cross the Kidron Valley and they come into the garden? What happens? Now yeah, look, we got to an answer. You get visual signals here. Yes, they pray. Jesus says, look, I am going to go pray. 
and he says, hey, I'm going to take somebody with me. Anybody remember? Peter, James, and John. Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. So here they go. They're going to go over here. They're going to pray. And he says, all right, you guys don't fall into temptation. I'm going to go a little bit further and pray. And this is, this is the prayer that we think about on this night. We've just spent the last week talking about a very long prayer that's recorded and about how Jesus prays for his disciples. He prays for also for us. He prays for me, which I think is very, very powerful. But now the, the big prayer where an angel comes to him and Jesus is in grief and there, you know, the sweat is like blood and all of these things. John doesn't include that. That's not included in John's gospel. He just goes straight in. He says they pass the Kidron Valley and they go in and they said, um, on the other side there was an olive go grove and his disciples went into it. And now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with the disciples. So Judas came to the grove, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and Pharisees. They were there carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, who is it you want? So this is, com this is a very condensed portion of what happens when they cross over the valley and get into the garden. So if you want to... If we were studying, if we were studying the life of Christ, then we would be we would be departing from John here quite a bit. We would go over and we would spend a lot of time probably in Luke. We we get some stuff in Luke that you don't get some other places, and, and you would look at the synoptic gospels because John, he's trying to remember, he's trying to keep us focused on Jesus and Jesus being the Son of God. And so he comes in. He, he gets to this part, and he says, who, who are you looking for? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. And Jesus says, I am. And remember, Jesus, this is, John is the book of the I am statements. And he starts out, and he says, I am. And that's important. What, what's that the same language from? Remember, from the bush. It's the same language, it's the same name that God identifies himself to Moses. Moses says, who do I say that sent me? We need a name. You know, all these Egyptian gods, they've all got names. They've got, they're the gods of all this stuff. Who, who is this God? And he says, I am. And that's Jesus. Is, he said, who are you looking for? We're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am. And Judas, the traitor, was standing there with him. And when Jesus said, I am he, he drew back. They drew back. And they what? Fell to the ground. What is that a sign of? of what was that? Jesus' power, power and authority. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is a powerful moment in the garden with these people that have come. I mean, if this, I mean, again, if we were in the black and white movie, this is like, um, Frankenstein, is anybody, anybody, Rubel Shelley fans? You're not Rubel Shelley. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, so they, he didn't look, no, this, no jokes. So he, so in Frankenstein, remember they have the mob that comes together. It's what it, this is the picture that I see in my mind is that there's torches and there's, there's people come together. There's guards that, that have come out there. And so they're, they've all come together. And by just saying, I am he, what does George, I mean, what did they do? They all, they bow down, they fall down. And, and, and then Jesus, again, he says, who is it you want? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I told you, I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words that um, he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one that you gave me. And then in verse 10, what happens? Verse 10, John chapter 18, he says, I am he. He identifies himself twice, says, come and get me. And what happens? All right, I don't know. I, don't, I have not been in a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat training, not, but I don't think the ear is usually the place that you, you start to attack. Um, I've watched a little bit of videos on, on uh, self-protection and stuff, and there's a lot of, 
I have been in a couple of fights, and I did do a damage to one guy's ear, but I was really young. And yeah, I think that it was probably a, I think it was probably one of those swing and a miss kind of things. And uh, so he was a fisherman and not a swordsman. Um, but he's ready. I mean, it, it's so much time has gone by. I mean, we, if, if, because we, because John gives us this discourse, and we we could have just skipped over it to kind of keep things moving in a timeline. But in you remember at the beginning of John chapter eleven, he gets word that his good friend is sick, and he says, "We've got to go back to Jerusalem. We need to go back there." And Thomas says, "But Lord, we can't go back. You know why we can't, why can't we go back? Because there's people there that want to kill you." And he says. You know, but when the light is light, then we can walk in the light, and then that's where we're going to go. And he goes back to Bethany, and as they headed, he said, okay, which way is Bethany? They head off, and what does Thomas say as he goes? We'll, we'll go and die with him. We're ready. Now's the time. And then, so then, fast forward, although it's been weeks, just fast forward a couple of days, and they're in the upper room, and Peter is there, and he says, Jesus, I'm going someplace that you can't go. I'm going to go someplace else that you can't go. And Peter goes, I'm always, that's impossible, because I'm always going to go where you go. And Jesus says, hang on, Peter, you know what? Before we hear the rooster crow twice, what's going to happen? You're going to deny me three times. But Peter is up to this point. He's still in. We get to John 18, verse 10. It says he takes out a sword. The, the word that's used there is probably like a long knife and maybe like a dagger. And he's ready to, to do some damage. And he goes, he makes a swing. He gets a cut. And the only way that we know this was Peter is from John. The, the other gospel writers do not name names. So the, the only one that names names is, is John. And he says, oh, yeah, but it's Peter. But I think, I think he may be, why do you think that he includes Peter in here? Why he calls him out? Well, the other gospel writers just say a disciple, a disciple did it. Harry. So not only is Peter named, but the victim is named. The servant is named Malchus. Only place that the servant is named also. And um, that, that would lend that this was included to be a witness. You can talk to Peter. You can talk to Malchus. You can see if what I'm saying, what I'm claiming here is the truth. So that, okay, that, that's a very interesting thought that of the whole crowd, only the only guy... <laughs> That is named as Malchus. John is John. He gives us tell by name because they can serve as witness. Why other? Why any other reasons? I mean, there's not a wrong or right answer. Chris is going to help us. She's going to say something here. Well, you you shook your hand like it was another miracle. He healed the guy's ear. Except, guess what? John doesn't say that he healed the guy's ear because John is John about miracles. John is remember he only he has zero parables. He only has eight miracles. Six of them are unique to him, and he does not mention that the ear is healed. And matter of fact, the only gospel writer that mentions that is the physician Luke. He's the only one. But I think John's also giving Peter credit. For doing something, knowing that this, you know, had happened about Jesus said you're going to deny me, and then later on it's written that he did deny him. But he's like, you know, but Peter was the one that stepped up to protect Christ, even though it may not have been right. Yeah, it may not have been right, like Chris says. But Peter is the one that stepped up. Listen, if we get when and we are, we're going to get through John chapter 18. If we when we get through John chapter 18, how does is this a good chapter for Peter or a bad chapter for Peter? It's bad. This is this chapter is going to have the, the rooster crowing in it. And so I, I don't think it's an accident that John calls out Peter. Also, John, in a few weeks, John is going to end his gospel in with the 21st chapter, which centers around 
a, a long conversation between Jesus and who? Peter. If one of the, one of the, probably one of the most common sermon illustrations that you've ever heard is the restoring of of Peter in John chapter 21, the only, only gospel writer that includes this, this story. And I think, that, I think that John is purposely saying, look, it is, he wants us to understand that, that we can identify with Peter, that there are moments, maybe even in the same day, maybe even in the same worship service, maybe even in the same conversation, where we think we're up here connected with God, and then three sentences later, we're like, I don't even know who he is. And that's and I think John wants us to see Peter that way. He wants us to see somebody that is so on fire that he is willing, he's saying, let's do it. If this is what we're here for, I'm ready. And then in just a little bit, He's not going to. Now, there's there's a lot of other, you can read a lot of commentaries that say that, that Peter was not, uh, that Jesus had to heal this servant. Otherwise, there would have been evidence that Peter had been a part of a rebellion and Peter could have been punished uh, along with Jesus. And, and Jesus had said that he wasn't going to lose any of these people. And there's great plans for Peter later on. And so there's all kinds of commentaries you can read about uh, but uh, has been pointed out, yes, the, the servant's ear is healed. We get to 10, and he says he struck the high priest servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus, and Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Uh, shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? And perhaps John is the one who names Malchus, because this, is, this could be a very simple reason. He might have been the only one that knew his name. Of the people that were there, he might have been the only one of the disciples that actually knew that servant. And we're going to see later on in John in chapter 18, he's, he's going to do something. We're pretty sure that it's John. He's going to do something that the other gospel writers don't include because I've never been to one. Have, have you ever been to one of those fancy clubs where you have to know somebody to get in? We're not the fancy club. Dave Gare is the only one. This, no, he, no, he's not. We are not the fancy club kind of people, I guess. Where you have to know somebody to get in. Well, that they're going to go to the fancy club, and you have to know someone to get in, and Peter can't get in. And he is going to get in here in, in just a little bit. So we get here to uh, verse 12, and it says, In the detachment of soldiers with the commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him, and they brought him first to Annas, who was the... Now, this is where the whole thing just gets very confusing. How many trials does Jesus have on this night? Three? How about six? There, well, three... And again, so he's going to go, and now, and you can't get all of it from John because you're just looking, well, because John is going to give us Annas, and I think he might be the only gospel writer who gives us Annas. I think everybody else says they go straight to the high priest who's Caiaphas and who is the son in law of Annas. So, first, the, there's a three, what, what works out to be three Jewish trials or three Jewish. Um, interrogations. So there's Annas, and then he's going to go to Caiaphas, and then early in the morning, they're going to call together the Sanhedrin. So you've got three phases of Jewish trial, and then the, the, they, the Sanhedrin says, this guy is guilty, he needs to be put to death, and they send him to Pilate. And Pilate takes a look at him, and he says, Oh, you're from Galilee? Well, I'm not, I'm not in charge of Galilee. And he sends him to Herod. So he, he sends him to Herod. So he goes from Pilate. So he's been to Annas, Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin. Then he goes to Pilate. Pilate sends him to Herod. Herod is sad or excited? 
very excited. Why? He's been waiting for this moment. He's been waiting for this moment because he wants to have, uh, he wants to see, he's heard a lot about Jesus. And the big thing is he wants to do what? He wants to see a miracle. He said, like, this is like you're going to Vegas and you've got a ticket to the comic, I mean, to the magic show. And you're like, I want to see a great magic show. And so in comes Jesus and, and, and it's not, it's not a great, uh, he asked Jesus questions and Jesus is like, I know this is, Jesus knows this is going to end and I know it's not going to end with you. The Bible doesn't say that, but he doesn't answer the questions and Herod sends him back to Pilate. So then he gets to the final stage. So you have to go, you have to, if we're doing the life of Christ, we would have to be in all the gospels to come up with all of the different trials or different interrogations that Jesus goes through this night. And so, but he starts out that he goes to, um, Annas and they, uh, and so when he's there, uh, they, it says they bound him and they brought him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas and the high priest that year. And Caiaphas was the one who said, it's better that one uh, man should die for the people, advised the Jews, it'd be good for one man that died for the people. And then Simon, another disciple following, G and another disciple were following Jesus. Now in the gospel of John, when we, when a disciple is not named, it's just a generic individual disciple. Who is it? It's John. John, and you can we can go back and you can kind of see how this works out. And by looking at all the gospels, you can say, well, that pretty much has to be John because that's who was there. But so it's John. And so another disciple was following. And because the disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside. And so um, he waited outside at the door. And the other disciple who was known to the high priest came back and spoke to the girl on duty and brought Peter in. Now, if you remember back, it was, I think it was like four years ago when we studied, started the study of John, we were, we were like, well, who is John? And John might have been from a family of some wealth or from some prominence. And the reason we think that might be was because when James and John leave their dad, the fisherman, who takes over? He said, the servants. He said, well, I guess that's going to be more work for the servants. So they had servants. They were not, uh, uh, they had some, at least some means. And he was, John was known when they come to the house of the high priest, John was known there. And this is not, this is in Jerusalem. This is not in his hometown. So this is, he is, he was known, at least it, at least it seems like he was known. He was known well enough that he could get Peter in. And so, um, and so they brought Peter in and the, the girl at the, at the gate, you're not one of his disciples, are you? The girl at the door asked Peter. And he replied, I am not. It's verse 17. Verse 10 of John chapter 18, what is Peter doing? He's doing ear manicures. He is, whoosh, and then in verse 17, he is sitting here and he goes, I'm not. I'm not one of them. And then it was cold and the servants and officials stood around the fire they have made to keep warm. And Peter was standing there warming himself. And so meanwhile... Meanwhile, while Peter's out here by the fire warming himself, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching, and he said, I've spoken openly uh, to, uh, to the world. I've always taught in the synagogues of the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret, and you're questioning. Um, so why are you questioning me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. And when Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? And Jesus said, if I said something wrong, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Anna sent him still bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. As Simon Peter stood there warming himself, he was asked, you are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. And in verse 26, one of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the olive grove? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the rooster began to crow. 
So, just a second, Roger. And so if you think John is giving us some details here, John is able to get Peter in. We're getting this detail here. And then he's denied. And he's, he knew that the person was a relative of the servant. So we're learning a little bit more about John. Okay, go ahead. And uh, Luke 22, uh, I went and found the verse to make sure, but it says the verse uh, 61, the Lord turned. Well, after the rooster crowed, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the words of the Lord, how he had said, for the rooster crows three times, you'll deny. I, I just can't imagine. Man, that's so hard. Ugh. The Lord turned and looked. Man, if that was me, oh, I'm dead. <laughs> yeah, and, and somebody can look, but I think it's it may be in Matthew's gospel that Jesus looks at him and Peter what? He, he's, he cries. And... He cries and what and runs away. It's this this is in the just a short time from when he was ready to, to give everything. And that's like me so much. I think I'm up here and then a challenge comes and I'm and I'm I try to avoid the challenge or I try to do something. But yeah, it's uh so this is Peter and, and John gives us this glimpse glimpse of him. The rooster crows, and they've got Jesus bound, and they led him from Caiaphas in verse 28 to the palace of the Roman governor, and by now it was early morning. And, to, and John gives us this point that you don't get from the other gospel writers. So they come into the Roman governor, so they're going to go see Pilate, and it says, by now it is early morning, and to avoid ceremonial unclean, uncleanness, the Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover or to participate. Passover was seven days, so don't get all hung up on when was Passover because there were feasts that were going on for seven days of the Passover, and they wanted to be able to participate in the Passover, and he says they would not go into the guard, or go into the, the, uh, the palace of the Roman governor and do you get the hypocrisy? Does it, does it, do you see it at all? I mean, what had Jesus done wrong? Why did these people, these people, there's, if you go back, if you go back to Exodus 20, you get the big, what, the, what I call the big 10, the, the 10 commandments. And so you can look in there and there's some of them, uh, there's, some of them that are going to be violated tonight and, and in this day. One of them is, thou shalt not kill. You should not, thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet another man's wife. Well, they're not just coveting another man's wife. I think they're coveting his glory, his power, his honor. And so, I mean, but guess what? We may be doing all these things, but you know what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to step over that line because if I go into that place, I'm going to be what? I'm going to be unworthy. Now, these other things I can do because I've rationalized somehow that it is okay, that is for the greater good. Now, not that any of us would ever rationalize anything for the greater good. We know we would never, as a matter of fact, in a little bit, they're, it's, they're going to say, Pilate is going to ask Jesus, he's going to say, well, they say that you're this. And he says, Jesus says, you speak the truth. And Pilate is going to respond, truth? What is truth? And so we can rationalize all these things. And so here we are, we're coming into this. I know we got lots of people. Hang on. We're going to, and he says, he comes before Pilate, and these people are saying, we're not going to go in because we want to remain pure. And if you remember, what is the, John is constantly in his Gospels bringing about the conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees and Jesus and the leaders because Jesus keeps doing something. He keeps healing people when? On the Sabbath. And that is a huge issue with the uh, the Jewish leaders, that Jesus is not obeying the Sabbath, that he's letting blind people see, and he's letting lame people walk. 
And so then these very people who get upset about seeing the Jews that they were responsible for being healed because it's a Sabbath are saying, I am not going to go into there because then I would be unworthy. Okay, Roger and then Wanda. I, I think they, uh, well, before Rome, they might have already taken care of business, but they need Rome's permission to put him to death. Okay, yeah, that is, that is one of the things that's very key to the story. The irony um, has, has really touched me that Jesus, who was the lamb and was being sacrificed for them and for us, um, was in that room and they would not go in that room because they wanted to be clean for the Passover, which was, it was what was the lamb was set up to do so it was that's what it was for Wanda I think is drawing a a picture here of the irony is that the only way that they were going to be clean for the Passover lamb the only way that they could truly become clean was because of the lamb of God as as John is the one that points out in his first chapter and he says so and it's kind of ironic that they're not going to go into where the real lamb is. The real lamb. You, anybody else have some comments? I don't want to. Okay. Thank you, Brett. I, th I think you probably stole what I was going to say, but um, which is good because I was thinking it and I was like, well, maybe that's not right. But the um, it's kind of three points here. The first one is uh, I think many times we try and take these um, these things out of context, historical context. And for me, that's what makes the Bible interesting is that these things happened in a context. And if you think about, you know, you had the Maccabean period before that, you had it sort of carrying over into this 100, 200 years um, during Christ's life and after. And so the Romans were very interested in uh, quelling these rebellions. But you had leaders who, in different areas, uh, were more or less interested sometimes. Herod tended to be not quite as interested. Pilate tended to be more interested in suppressing uh, the rebellion. But then you had the, as you just mentioned, the, um, the Pharisees and the high priest who said, hey, we can't do this because of these technicalities. Pilate says, I don't, I don't find anything wrong to him, so I'm going to give him back to you, or you determine what's going to happen to him, uh, because, you know, I don't want to, I don't find anything wrong with him. But then you had uh, the high priest saying, it's better that he be sacrificed, like you said, he be sacrificed, or one person be sacrificed for all of us, because they had been having the rebellions, and that's why the, the two, what, you know, in, that I learned were thieves on the cross were really, I mean, they were uh, rebels, right? And I think some of the newer versions say that. And so it's all in historical context. And I think Peter's, as somebody mentioned, it, is a metaphor for us. I think very much like what we do, you know, I think Peter gets a bad rap. Um, because I, I see myself as Peter, right? Just like you said, in the same sentence, we could, yeah. we could chop off somebody's ear and then deny Christ three times, right? Yeah. And... To me, this is one of the most poignant chapters in the entire Bible for me, or particularly in the New Testament, because of all that. This is so rich. And, um, but I guess going back to my original point of don't take it out of the context in which it's written. It's, it's not just a story. And all of these things had meaning and for the people that are there, but especially for us, but it's all meaningful. And that makes it even much more rich for us. So, yeah, exactly. The, comment, not really. A, no, no. It's exactly what we're going to get to is that that Pilate says, look, he's done nothing wrong. You guys punish him. And he says, yeah, but the punishment we want to give is not available to us because the punishment we want to give is we want him killed. We want him out of here. And so, yeah, it, there is a 
there's a great history. It's great. And it's a very wonderful chapter. And I mean, I'm just, you know, by now that I'm so in love with the gospel of John, there's just so, it's so rich. So many things are going on. And he says, all right. So we get to Pilate came out to them and he says, um, uh, in verse 30, uh, verse 29, he says, what charges are you bringing against this man? And verse 30, uh, if he were not a criminal, they replied, we have not handed him over to you. Probably said, take him for yourselves and judge him by your own law, which great. And he says, but here comes the big problem in verse 31. It says, but we have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objective. So this is a, a big situation where they say, look, yeah, you take him, you have your court, your law, your rules, you go and deal with him. And he said, yeah, but we can only go to some point, only to, to a certain point. And, and I, we're going we're gonna to go over by 90 seconds, I'm sorry, but only because Brett had such a good point. If you think about Galilee and you think about uh, Jerusalem, would, would we ever see... So Herod is up here in the area of Galilee, and then you have Pilate down here in Jerusalem, which is a, in their way is a metropolitan city. Would we ever see a difference in political beliefs, a difference in government and the mindset of government between a large city and a small rural area? We see it all over. We see it all over the place. You see things that are in rural Oklahoma that you will not see in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And in, cause I bring that up as an example, cause that's where I grew up, but you can go to Utah and there are things that you can see and experience in Logan that you don't experience in Salt Lake city. I have good friends there. I have friends that, and you know, it, it's, it's just very different. And so I think there's also a political difference when you see between the way Herod and the way Pilate are going to deal with this. So now back to our regular programming. It says, then uh, he says, uh, this happened so that the words, verse 32 happened so that the, the, the Jesus had spoken, indicated kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. And then Pilate went back inside of the palace and summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? He said, is that your idea or did others t talk to you about me? And Pilate says, am I a Jew? It was your people and your chief priests who have handed you over to me. What is it you have done? He said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Verse 38, Pilate says, what is truth? With this, he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis to charge him, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no not him, give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in a what? In an insurrection, in a rebellion. He said, no, don't give us Jesus. We're this close. We're this close to getting what we wanted. We're going to get, I mean, if you remember, it starts in John chapter 2. Mary comes to Jesus and he says, we're at this wedding and we are out of wine. And he says to his mother, what? Woman? I never called Edna Osborne woman, just so you know. And she was a short little thing, but I never would have said that. If I had said it once, I never would have said it twice. I guarantee you. Um, but he says, woman, it's not my time. And Jesus knows he spent this night in prayer. He spent this evening with his disciples. He's washed their feet. We're still on that same thing which happened weeks ago in this class, but it's in that same night. He's been this, and it's no longer. He says, yeah, it is my time. I wish it weren't. The other gospel writers say that he goes to God, and he says, if there's another way, if there's a plan B, then bring it on. And he says, yeah, 
And so they're this close to getting what they want. There's a point here, and I don't see it in John, but uh, it, it says, they say, His blood be upon our heads. <sighs> yeah, they're ready. And, you know, it, which is, we're, we're going to get into this, but, you know, if you just go right over from the end of John, the way our Bible is organized, you go from the end of John, it goes right into Acts. And in Acts chapter 2, there's this big sermon, and I wonder. I've been my, I've been studying Acts this week, and I wonder of the people that heard that sermon, how many of them were in this same group that were saying crucify him. We're we're out of time, dear God. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for um, the Gospel of John and for all of the the Gospels. We thank you for the life of Christ. We thank you for the salvation that comes from the blood of your son. God, fill us with your spirit. We pray that uh, we can uh, be in this place and that we can fill this building with your praises. In the name of Jesus, amen.